July 16, 1914, Reading Eagle, Reading, Pennsylvania. Hunting treasure on the mountain. Many people spend nights searching for wealth that Reuben Kebach alleges is buried on Neversink. He is not annoyed by their efforts, says the gold and jewels are safe. East Reading is all excited since Reuben Kebach announced that untold wealth is to be had for the digging somewhere on Neversink Mountain. Several parties armed with picks, shovels, and spades scoured the hill from top to bottom and from end to end on both slopes Wednesday night, undaunted by mud and rain, aided by the flickering rays of smoky lanterns. They persisted in their search, turning up the earth at many places, uncovering diverse objects, but finding nothing of the slightest value. Meanwhile, what of Reuben Kebach? Is his peace disturbed by the possibility of the fortune which the fates have decreed is his rightful property being discovered by another? No, he is a man of faith. He says he knows that the treasure lies hidden from the greedy search of men. He knows that without the proper instrument and the authentic instructions, the fortune is safer in never sink than in the sub-treasury. It is divinely protected, he thinks. When the Eagle reporter learned of the general quest of the treasure, he visited Mr. Kebach. The reporter was greeted with a quiet, almost confident smile and a rather diffident hand clasp. This can be explained by the fact that Mr. Kebach is somewhat averse to publicity. Do you know that your fortune is in grave danger? queried the interviewer. No, I know nothing of the kind. Do you refer to those misguided people who were out on the hill on Wednesday digging up the earth? All I have to say is that if they would dig 20 feet deep on every square inch of this hill, they would not find anything of value. That fortune is absolutely unattainable by anyone lacking the magnetic compass and the instructions as imparted in the sixth and seventh books of Moses and the prayer of hope. I thought that I had made that plain before. Of course, if these people persist in snooping about, it's up to them. I assured several who passed my house with spades on their shoulders that it would be time wasted. They laughed and heeded me not. It won't hurt them. Many of them need exercise, and until they get through, they will have a surfeit of bodily exertion. The thing that I'm afraid of is that they will catch cold in this rainy weather. I would not want to be responsible for the death of anybody due to my announcement that there is money in the hill. One party of three made the strongest bid for the treasure. Before starting out by a process of elimination, they decided to search on the southern slope of the mountain, facing the river at a point about 200 yards below the Highland House. They said they had a private tip that a bucket of rubies of inestimable value was interred in that vicinity. They toiled all of Wednesday night. The steady thud of the spade against earth and the sound of falling dirt in the small area of dim radiance, diffused by the lantern, furnished a scene that Edgar Allan Poe would have delighted in picturing. Whenever a deep spade thrust brought the steel against a large stone with a large metallic ring, the hearts of the treasure hunters beat rapidly for a moment. They were almost afraid to investigate, but it was always the same. Nothing of value showed itself. After excavating at more than a dozen places, on a premonition of one of the party, they proceeded to that portion of Neversink Mountain known as Nanny Goat Hill. Here, at a point about 100 yards back from the road, they decided to dig. Soon, a very powerful odor, not a pleasant one either, assailed their nostrils. What could it be? Did money or rubies, long buried, have a disagreeable odor? They decided to find out. They did. Digging a little deeper, a dark object, which in the dim, ghost-like light assumed a weird and gruesome aspect, loomed before their eyes in the pit. The lantern was brought closer. Holding his breath, one of the men spunked courage enough to reach down in the hole. He grasped something sharp and hard. He summoned his courage to the sticking point and lunged backward, bringing with him the disinterred carcass of what was a perfectly dignified goat. Judging by the odor, the goat must have been under the sod of Nanny Goat Hill for quite a time. 
discouraged by their continued failures, damp and muddy, disheartened and back weary, they decided to abandon the search. May 3, 1909, The Daily Times, Beaver, Pennsylvania. Buried Treasure, copyright 1908 by T.C. McClure. The death of James Norris of the village of Colville produced the first wave of excitement the place had experienced since the chimney of the Methodist Church had burned out seven years previously. Mr. Norris was an old bachelor. He was a crank and a miser. It was sure that he had plenty to live on, and yet he lived alone and in squalor. He lent money where anyone would pay him 10% interest, and he was the owner of several pieces of real estate. Among them was an old cider mill. It was in the rear of this that the old man had his residence. In the fall, he ground apples and made cider for all who would buy, and this was his only work. It had been talked over a hundred times by the villagers that Norris had his money buried where robbers could not get it, and that in case he died suddenly, his heirs, if any came forward, would have great trouble in finding it. This was a real cause of worry to many citizens. Some of them even went so far as to advise the old man to tell them the exact spot so as to save time in digging. When he refused to do so, it was taken as another evidence of his meanness. On the morning that his death became known, the village of Colville was as excited as if a circus had come to town. Now the disputed point as to how much he was worth and how much money he had buried would be known to all. There were some who would have gone hunting for that money right away had not the justice of the peace stepped in and taken charge. Men came from a distance of 50 miles to help in that search. At one time, the searchers numbered nearly a thousand, and so many strangers had to be lodged and fed that Colville took on a boom. The first thing was to search the old mill. Men fought each other as they crowded into it. Then the half acre of sterile soil around it must be explored, then the marsh and the piece of woods back of it most of the searchers gave up after a day or two, but some continued on for a fortnight. At the end, however, nothing had been found. Five years passed, and then came the next brainstorm. A tin peddler drove into the village to remain over Sunday. On Sunday afternoon, he wandered down to the old mill to have a look at the ruins. A high wind on Saturday night had brought roof and frame to the earth. In mousing around, his eye was caught by the flutter of a piece of paper, and an hour later the village was seething. The peddler was no hog. He had found a good thing, but was ready to divvy with the public. If he got $10,000 out of it, the villagers might share the rest. That piece of paper was the key to the old miser's buried treasure. It must have been concealed in a hollow beam all the time. The writing on it ran as follows. October 17th. 1888, B1, B of C today, 7 PW of the BOT. The town didn't think much of that peddler when he entered it. He was looked upon as just a common tin peddler who took paper, rags, sheepskins, old iron, beeswax, butter and eggs, and such things in exchange for his tin pans and dippers. Before Sunday had passed, however, men were taking off their hats to him and wondering when he would be governor of the state. He was the only one that could make any sense of the paper, and he didn't give it away until after he had been invited to dinner by the justice. Then he read it off as, Buried, one barrel of cash today, seven paces west of the big oak tree. It was evening when the puzzle was solved, lanterns were lit and bonfires built, and the seven paces paced off. They struck at a spot where there had been no digging, and the justice appointed ten men to guard the place for the night. In the morning, the ruins would be searched for more papers. There must be others. When a miser begins to bury barrels of cash, he does not stop at one. He goes right ahead and buries five or six in order to make the search after his death interesting. Hasty breakfasts, or none at all, were eaten next morning, and then the ruins were searched. Not an inch of beam or board escaped scrutiny twice over. Nothing further was found except an old tobacco box, and that was empty. 
A groan of despair followed the conclusion of the search. The miserable old man had buried only one barrel of cash after all, and the tin peddler was to have $10,000 out of that. Four men began to dig at seven paces due west of the big oak tree. The ground had settled down as hard as asphalt, but had it been cast iron, they would have stuck to the job. There were 600 people in a circle about them. When the shout of discovery went up, one of the picks had struck the barrel. There was a great rush, and it was a quarter of an hour before it could be cleared of dirt and lifted out. Then, there were more cheers and more rushes. The barrel was upended at last, and as the head was knocked in, the price of real estate in Colville soared to the clouds. Next moment, it fell with a thud, like that of a brick house coming down. The B of C was a barrel of cider instead of a barrel of cash. The old man had buried it as an experiment to see what the taste would be years hence. Two minutes of awful suspense, half a dozen terrible yells in chorus, and then the peddler went flying for his life. M. Quad.